And back to us here in Kourou. So talking about explorers, we have two of the faces of space exploration with us here today. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome two of Europe's most experienced astronauts. We have Matthias Maurer and we have Thomas Pesquet with us here today. Back to us here in Kourou. So talking about explorers, we have two of the faces of space exploration with us here today. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome two of Europe's most experienced astronauts. We have Matthias Maurer and we have Thomas Pesquet with us here today. So um, I have my first question is for you, Matthias. Um, it's all very well, um, you know, sending juice out there. But when we go out there to space, send, uh, you know, uh, spacecrafts like juice, what does it bring us back here on Earth? I think at the beginning of everything is the human curiosity. We humans, we want to understand. When you fly to space, we want to understand and learn. It's also applicable in science and technology in general. And once we understand, we want to translate it in, into applications, see like how can we make our life on Earth easier, better, um, with the knowledge that we gained in space. And so all the stuff that we do in space, it directly feeds back into applications. Just looking at the huge solar panels of the probe, 85 square meters, it's like today, we are talking about green energy to have life on Earth more sustainable without solar panels developed for space and then spin off onto Earth applications. This transformation in energy for Earth applications would not be possible. And um, I mean, sometimes it takes longer. Sometimes the application will come years, years after mm. the science has been done. So uh, thanks to um, Einstein's relativity theory, we have now the best navigation system in the world, the Galileo system, and everybody can use this with a mobile application in their hands. Thank you very much. So um, we're sending JUICE out on its journey today. But um, what about the upcoming destinations for human space exploration? Yes, so we humans, we can unfortunately not yet travel uh, such large distances to uh, Jupiter. So we fly to low Earth orbit, the International Space Station, and once this will end, we will continue with new, more modern platforms. But then we also continue exploration. We are part of the Artemis program. ESA is an essential part of, of NASA with the European Service Module. So we will be flying to uh, the moon, and uh, Thomas and I and our colleagues from the astronaut Core, we are dreaming of flying the first Europeans to the moon, being among them, uh, hopefully stepping also on the planet. And it shall be a continuous present on the moon. And on moon, we will learn a lot for technology that we spin back to Earth applications, but we will also learn for later on for missions to Mars. So talking about, you know, going to the moon, I mean, um, Tomar, uh, are you getting ready uh, to you know, take part in any of these missions that Matthias is telling us about? I think, I think we are. I think ESA made the bold decision to uh, send Europe onto this adventure, which was the right decision to make. Um, I think we, we have a variety of destinations today. We should not forget Lower Orbit and the International Space Station, our friend and colleague Andreas Morgensen. Uh, he's now in the final stretch for his mission, launching in August. And then we'll have a, a rotation of mission missions to low Earth orbit. We have new colleagues who have just started at the European Astronaut Center, um, and we're glad to have them. There's going to be so many missions to fly in the future, and obviously the Artemis missions. Everybody's trying to you know, do their part. Everybody's trying to contribute what they've learned in space, what they've learned before, to go as a team, and that's what we're focusing on for the years to come. So I hear the two of you telling me that you're both able and ready to go. Do you see yourself taking off from Europe's spaceport here in French Guiana, Thomas? I think it would be a dream, but it's more than a dream because we're having this conversation. We're working on this independent you know, access to space for humans from French Guiana. We have all the building blocks you know, we've had. We've had a reliable launcher, Ariane 5, Ariane 6 is going to follow suit. We've had the ATV, the transfer vehicle. We've had the CRV, the return vehicle. We have Space Rider. We have everything. We have all the building blocks. We just have to put them together. And for this, you need a vision. I think we have the vision. Now we need a mandate. Uh, but tomorrow, you can imagine, now that Europe is more mature, now that Europe is you know, growing on the scene, people feel more and more European, sometimes because of the crisis around us. But at least the result is we're being more united. And I think that would be a fantastic project to kind of inspire Europe and to channel the best that Europe has to offer and to make Europeans dream for generations to come. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Stay with us because we have Josef Aschbacher. Josef, thank you so much for joining us. You are ESA Director General. Well, a very simple question to you. I mean, you know, we're talking here about, you know, the capability of, of space explorations. Are you going to make this happen? 
human well, space exploration, that, of course. I mean, it needs a lot of people to make this happen. Uh, but of course, uh, my job as Director General of ESA is to to make sure that the discussion takes place and that we have a, a discussion in Europe and preparing decisions in order to make this happen. In fact, uh, we just received a report from a high-level advisory group uh, called Revolution Space, and that really means a revolution for Europe in space uh, to really engage, uh, bring Europe one level uh, higher uh, in, uh, uh, in space exploration, literally, and make sure that Europe has all these capabilities uh, which uh, Thomas uh, and Matthias have just described. So yes, uh, uh, we're, doing, we're doing everything to make it happen. But uh, Lise, uh, today we're here in front of the uh, screens of Choose. Let's talk about Choose because that's such an exciting mission. Thank you so much, Josef. Thank you, Thomas. Matthias, thank you very much for being thank with you. us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. So for those of you who are joining us, we are yeah, just under 12 minutes to lift off. And we're here, I'm here in Jupiter Control. Uh, we're about to see uh, Ariane 5 take off with Juice under its fairing, uh, heading for Jupiter. And I am here with Raphael Chevrier from Ariane Space. Raphael is going to take us through every step along the way of this mission. Welcome to Road to Space, Raphael. Hello, Liz. So um, why don't we just you take us through maybe the, the next steps coming up now? Oh, absolutely. So Iron 5 this morning is going to launch towards the east. So at such low latitude, we benefit from what we call the slingshot effect given by the rotation of the Earth, providing enough speed for juice. The launcher first performs a pitch maneuver to get into the required direction. And only 2 minutes and 17 seconds after liftoff, the two boosters have done their jobs of providing enough uh, the main thrust, and they are detached from the launcher. And shortly after that, the fairing, which protected the spacecraft from the frictions of the air, is separated in two halves as we have crossed the limits of the atmosphere. We just don't, don't need it anymore. And once the launcher reaches an intermediate orbit, the main stage is cut off and separated. We then enter the second second proper phase of the flight with the ignition of the upper stage. The engine powers for about 16 minutes in order to raise speed and altitude and reach the targeted orbit for juice. The little towers that we see on the motion picture represent a chain of telemetry stations that are receiving data from Iron 5 all along the flight path. And after some orientation maneuver, juice is separated on a liberation orbit meaning it will have the required speed to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. This is almost the end of the mission for the launcher perspective, as we still need to perform some disposal maneuvers of the upper stage, but this is definitely the beginning of the journey for juice. ESA teams will use the North Sea ground telemetry stations in Australia to acquire signal from the spacecraft and take full control of it. I think I'll take over from here, yeah. Raphael, because I can actually hear... There's an announcement here. Yes, announcement here. Uh, we're bringing you this information live. I'll actually listen to what's being said in French, and I'll come back to you and translate. Sounds like we're heading for... There is a risk of lightning right uh, here. Yes, a weather. The weather, weather is quite challenging. Right, it's been announced. So Marianne Claire has just announced that we're going to uh, halt the, uh, launch, uh, the launch operations for now, for today, due to uh, weather conditions. But what does this mean, Raphael? So it means that we usually check um, whether it's um, the winds at high altitude, the winds yeah. in the vicinity of the launch pad, mm. and also the risk of uh, lightning. This is the last, the latest uh, criteria that is mm. not suit for um, a launch today, unfortunately. Uh, exactly. This is out of our control, but it also reminds you that we don't take any risk when it comes to launching a satellite Absolute, into space. Absolutely. So as Rafael was saying, um, it has been announced that for, for today the liftoff is going to be postponed. Of course, uh, this our, our passenger is safe and sound under the fairing and uh, will, of course, be bringing you all the information on a new date as soon as we get it. Uh, we have Stefan uh, Israel who is going to come and make a, an announcement to us right now. Stefan, welcome back. So yes, <laughs> faster than we had imagined. Yes. But 
it's beyond our control, right? Yes, for sure. You know, uh, it's a part of our business. Yeah. And what is important is when you lift off, you must make sure that all the parameters are green. Again, the launcher was uh, OK, juice was OK. But the final checks made by Kness on the weather were not OK. You have two reasons not to lift off, high altitude winds or risk of lightning. Yeah. The high altitude winds were OK. There was a risk of lightning, so now you see a red on the screen. Mm -hmm. What is important is that the launcher and juice are in stable configuration and in full security. We will be back tomorrow morning, a few seconds before we aim at lifting off at 8.14 Washington time, 9.14 Guyana time tomorrow morning. Oh, there we go. So Stéphane has actually given us the news here live. So the next day is tomorrow morning. And of course, we're going to just bring that time forward by one minute. We're due to take off at 9.15. It's going to be 9.14, as you said. So we will see you all tomorrow at more or less the same time. and. We'll hope that the weather is going to be more clement uh, tomorrow. A little bit of patience and it will be okay tomorrow. Yes. Thank well, thank you. you very much, Stefan. And uh, well, uh, be assured that Juice is safe and sound under the fairing. It's just going to be, you have to be a little more patient. Another 24 hours, let's hope. Thank and you. that's it from us. Thank you, Stefan.